Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> Good evening, Pittsburgh and Universe. This is JC on a bike. My name is JC and this is Journal Club on a bike. I got a really detailed Journal Club for you tonight that I kind of flubbed last night because it was snowing so hard I couldn't read the little tiny notes that I had. And I started to mix up the two cell types and then I just bailed. So I'm hoping I can do a better job of it this week, this evening. This is a five-figure paper that details the microcircuit of the ventral palladium. The ventral palladium is a is a nucleus in the brain linked to the nucleus accumbens and striatum has an output nucleus kind of and gates the reinstatement and the behavior of of cocaine seeking. It is a it is a nucleus that's thought to underlie the, the behavioral state change that occurs when an animal becomes addicted, forgets where or, or the context in which they should be addicted and then the addiction reinstates. All, all of this is somehow governed by neurons in the ventral palladium. Of course in combination with nucleus accumbens striatum. So the idea is to dissect the ventral palladium and try to figure out what's going on there and so they're going to start by just showing you a proportion of the number of cells in the ventral palladium that are glutamatergic, GABAergic or express pro and keflon and keflin, pro and keflin is just a, a protein but it's a, sub, it mark, a good marker for a subset of GABAergic interneurons and so in the first figure there they show you a little Venn diagram with the GABAergic and glutamatergic cells largely separate and then the P, E, N, K cells the the pro and keflin cells are a kind of a subset inside of the GABAergic cells and there's some overlap there that they they mention but that's probably more likely to do due to lack of staining or this kind of thing it's it's not you know we were going to ignore those those funny outliers there for now and they are too. They're going to try and label and control these separate populations, these three populations, separately to see how they differentially affect cocaine seeking behavior. And, and it's important now, wow, look at that guy drive. It's important now to consider the paradigm that they're doing. <coughs> and the rats get addicted to cocaine so they have 10 or 12 days where when the light comes on and they poke their nose in the right hole then they get a direct infusion of cocaine into their brain cocaine is a hell of a drug and so after 10 or 12 days they become very good at you know waiting for the light when the light comes on they poke in the right hole and they're very good at it and as they get more addicted they occasionally even poke in the other hole just in case you know, maybe the left one's going to give me something today, but... And so those are inactive. That's inactive hole. And so when you look at inactive nose pokes, what you're looking at is cocaine-seeking behavior, but it's cocaine-seeking behavior in the wrong place. So you could see 
poking your nose in the wrong hole as being kind of an indication that the learning is not as complete or uh, fixed as, as it, you would want it to be. Perfect. Nice. So, in this little paradigm, oh yeah, I forgot that one thing in figure one. The other thing they do in figure one, which is very impressive, is they do a, a rabies tracing experiment to these three cell types to show what kind of input they're receiving from nucleus accumbens striatum. And if you're familiar with nucleus accumbens striatum, you know that there are D1 and D2 cells, D1 receptors and D2 receptors, that are expressed in two different cell types in the in the nucleus accumbens striatum. And so they're going to trace from D1 and D2 cells using rabies and show in a particularly, uh, maybe the best finding in this figure is that the pro and keflin subset of GABAergic cells seems to get largely D1 input. Um, search the figure again to make sure that's true, um, but I think it's mostly D1 input. And so then moving again on to figure two, what they're going to show you is the basic paradigm of the cocaine addiction. And if you want to put this in the context of like people and thinking about how people do it, then think about people, people going to their favorite bar. Let's say that we go to our favorite bar, Howlers, in Pittsburgh, and we start using cocaine at Howlers. Well, the way addiction works is that the context and the situation in which you, you become addicted is central to sort of re, reinstating and triggering the behavior. So if you don't go back to Howlers anymore, the bar that you use cocaine at, you're not going to feel this, this addiction, this desire, this weird motivation nearly as strongly as if you were to go back to Howlers. Even more strongly if the same band was playing there. Even if the same band was playing there, you almost got eaten. But if the same band was playing there and the same bartender was working, then about the only thing your brain could think about is who's going to give me my first line. So, in this thing, they're going to put the animal in a box, get him addicted to cocaine in the box, and then put him in the box several days where there is no cocaine. And so eventually, as you see in the first figure there on the bottom left panel, their number of active nose pokes goes way down in a few days. And eventually all the animals are this, you know, all the behaviors are down to zero. Basically they just go in the box again. Not looking for, oh shit, not looking for cocaine. Why did I stop there? So, I don't know what just happened there. So, what they're going to do then first, just to test this, I had to think about it and remember it for a minute here, is they're first just going to stimulate all the cells in the ventral palladium and look at how extinction and reinstatement works. And what they see is they, if they stimulate everything, then they can increase both of these things. They can... They can create a situation where where the animal doesn't the extinction doesn't work so well so the animal remembers a bit better and it seeks more cocaine behavior more cocaine seeking uh, during extinction or after extinction learning and reinstatement happens faster in these animals 
upon the cue presentation. Whoa! Gigantic pothole! My god! That's a car killer there. That would destroy my bike. So, in figure three, which is really the money figure, figure three is where they, instead of stimulating all of these cells at once, now they're going to stimulate these populations individually. The glutamatergic cells, the GABAergic cells, and the subset of GABAergic cells that express proencephalin. So, this paper is, sorry, this figure is the, the money figure. And if you look at any figure in detail, you're going to want to look at this figure. Because it's, this is where the meat of the paper is. Essentially, it's just going across GABA, P and K, and glutamatergic cells. And then underneath they show you bar graphs of the behavior from extinction, vehicle and stimulated, and from extinction and then um, uh, reinstatement. And what you see is if you stimulate the GABAergic cells, either the, all the GABAergic cells or the proencephalin cells by themselves, you increase cocaine seeking. And interestingly enough, if you look at the bars that are shown, you do not increase the inactive nose pokes, which the authors point out is a pretty good indication that by stimulating either of these two populations of inhibitory neurons, you increase cocaine seeking and not just increase behavior, not just increase the game participation, but you're evoking the memory, right? The animal knows that he's supposed to go to the active hole. And so that's, that's a very awesome result. And that's the first two. And, wow, that's awesome. Save the manual. Um, and then when they stimulate the glutamatergic cells, what's very interesting is that they can almost eliminate reinstatement. So if they stimulate the glutamatergic cells right before the extinction, the extinction is more pronounced than the control animals, which is impressive. And then furthermore, if they stimulate to, during reinstatement, the reinstatement doesn't happen at all. And that's monstrous. So that's essentially up and down regulation by GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons, right? The push-pull push is not as obvious on the, glutam on the GABAergic side, and I think the, the authors make a number of points about this, mainly that the GABAergic population is so much more heterogeneous that you can't expect it to have such a uniform response pattern. And I think that's valid. Um, who knows where that biker is going to go? And if she's going right, then she should be going right. So that's figure three. Figure three again is the money figure. That one, if you get that one, you get it all. This guy's going to pass me. Unbelievable. What a shithead. Figure four is single cell calcium stuff. And here they show you. Is it calcium signals? Yeah, I think it's calcium signals. And this is harder to interpret. There are more calcium signals in the inhibitory neurons when the animal is in the reinstatement training phase. And that's even more pronounced in the subset of GABA cells that are proencephalin positive and in contrast there's activity on both sides extinction and 
reinstatement for the glutamatergic cells. So it's it's not as clear of a result um, in terms of what these cells are doing. But if you take Figure Three and then look at this, then you know you got to put them two together. And Figure Three definitely shows that something's going on. And if it doesn't show up in the in the single cell calcium signals, that's not necessarily a deal breaker. So then in figure five, they're going to look at activity around the nose poke in these different cell types with the idea of trying to see if the activity of the animal in these, and they, sorry, the activity of these cells while the animal is learning changes in a way that might belie their role in the learning. And so what they want to look at is, you know, when, when do these cells fire around the nose poke? And so during reinstatement, for example, if you're given the animal more cocaine, then you might expect the be pank cells to light up. And that's what they see. They see that the V, uh, the ventral palladium GABAergic cells that present uh, that, that express this proenkephalin, these guys are also organizing their firing around the nose poke that gets rewarded. Interestingly enough, the glutamatergic cells also fire around the nose poke, but not when rewarded, when not rewarded during the extinction. So that's super cool because you're essentially seeing what are we doing here? I understand you got a brand new truck, but it's still got the gas pedal on the right side. And there's a green light. And you're in the middle of the road. You're just driving in the middle of the road with no turn signal, you freaking unbelievable Pennsylvania drivers. They're just unbelievable. Well, what makes me excited about this paper again is the push-pull. I'm really impressed when people get to the stage of understanding a microcircuit to where they are able to make the behavioral readout move in both directions. I think that's what I liked about Tony Gawa's paper, recent one and what I really like about this paper. It's a very convincing result when you're able to do that. Wow, I got tailwind again. It's not fair. I had tailwind on the way in. Okay, thanks for joining me on my ride. That was a paper by the Calibus Lab in South Carolina. Um, the first author is Heinbrook and he's now in Colorado. It's an excellent dissection of the ventral palladium circuit looking at glutamatergic, in, uh, glutamatergic neurons, gabaergic interneurons and a subset of gabaergic interneurons that also express proenkephalin. Um, they show some very specific results here that the gabaergic interneurons tend to influence or uh, increase cocaine seeking and stimulating the glutamatergic uh, neurons can increase extinction and uh, help the animal to resist reinstatement, which is a spectacular push-pull result. Um, in a field like addiction, this is a very, very big step forward. Uh, I think a lot of people have been looking at changes, synaptic changes in the nucleus accumbens, and, and now um, this paper also looks at outputs from the nucleus accumbens and striatum to the ventral palladium and looks very nicely in figure one using rabies. I think that data alone five years ago might have been a very, very big result. But now when you combine it with their chemo, chemogenetic activation of these cell types and look at how this affects the cocaine-seeking behavior, I think they've done a really extraordinary job at uh, explaining, or not explaining, but sort of uh, dissecting how these different subpopulations in the ventral palladium contribute differently to cocaine learning, cocaine seeking, and then also um, the extinction of addiction behavior. Um, if you liked it, like and subscribe. And this is JC on a bike and I'll see you next week.